service. I tell you what, that's just one of those things. I'm, I, I tell you, I've got to, you were talking about goosebumps earlier, Kevin? <laughs> I'm about ready to take flight, buddy. But, uh, <laughs> woo! <laughs> that's exciting, but I tell you what, I love, love services like this, uh, and it's just great to have each and every one of you here this morning, because that's a very special moment right now. We are about mm, an hour and 20 minutes away from the exact middle of the year. Yesterday was day 182. Today's 183, and after today, there's 182. So if you take 182, 182, you come up 364, add one, you get what? <laughs> so at noon, you're going to be exactly in the middle of the year. I see why you won't finance for all those years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's one of those things you can go home and say, hey, guess what useless piece of information Matt gave us this morning to open the service with. But listen, it is great to have you here every, every week uh, at Anchor Baptist Church, especially if you are with us for the very first time. We always want to take a moment to welcome those who are our guests for the very first time, let you know it's our honor and privilege to have you here with us. We're excited that you chose Anchor Church to be a part of the morning worship. Now, we only ask our guests to do one thing. We do not parade them around. We do not embarrass them. We don't even point them out. What we ask you to do is on your way out, if you'll look on the table in the foyer, you'll see a guest card just like this blue one up here on the overhead. Do us a favor, take just a minute, fill out that card, leave it sitting right there on the table. We'd love to just have a record of your visit here with us this morning. But again, thank you so much for choosing Anchor to be a part of your morning worship service. And we hope that you receive as much of a blessing being here as we are going to receive by you having been here. Congregation, as always, good to see your smiling faces this morning. Hope that you have got some great plans for this 4th of July weekend. Um, if you want, I will leave a little slip of paper uh, with my phone number on it so you can tell me what you're barbecuing and what you're cooking, what time. <laughs> and I will be more than happy to come out and, and join in the festivity. But listen, y'all have a great time remembering our awesome God, this awesome nation, but most of all, the families that he gives us, not only uh, from mother, father, sisters, brothers, but also the uh, family of God. So let's go ahead, church. Let's stand up. Let's turn around. Let's meet and greet everybody and then continue with praise and worship and song.
help us sing our prayer this morning? Lord, reign in me. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request for my only aim is that you reign.
Bible says there's no name under heaven by which man must be saved. Good morning. good morning it is good to be in god's house with you this morning i'm, I'm excited um just what god is is doing and and i and happy fourth of july um it's um it's 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 an important it's an important celebration it's an important time it really is and um uh, god has blessed us he has blessed us beyond measure if you look around the world and and i know and i know our certainly our country has uh has some issues we we've got some problems and um, certainly we do but as i look around the world i really truly believe that we are still the most blessed country on the face of the earth and i believe that god is is still there is a remnant of believers here in our country that god has not forgotten and that god will continue to be our strength and help us take a stand and, uh, and to be bold and, and standing on the truths of God's word. So I want to, as we celebrate that this weekend, I, I think this, it's important that anytime we celebrate, we understand that what we're doing is we're celebrating God's presence. We're selling God's strength, his, his love and his blessing to us in that celebration. I want to encourage you now, this coming Wednesday night, there will be no... Um, um, Bible study series, summer Bible study series this Wednesday night. We'll pick it up the following Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock. If you weren't able to be here uh, last week, we had a great time, small group type atmosphere, a lot of discussion, and questions are not only um, in order, but they're desired. It's, it's that, that format and looking uh, at God's Word. And uh, what we've been looking at, we're going to continue, is our position with God. How, 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 what's our position with God? We looked at being a child of God, and we're going to look at something, if you want to pre begin to prepare, is that we are priests. If, uh, if you don't know that, Scripture tells us that we are priests. I'll leave it at that, let you just kind of take a look at that and study that, and uh, maybe that'll intrigue you enough to come and join us in our Bible study the following Wednesday. It's important to that. We also, I, and I don't mention this enough, I, I feel bad that I don't, but we have a great ministry down at Greenfield Lake that God is using 
us every month using Anchor and the folks from Anchor to, uh, to take food and feed those that are in need, uh, that are hungry. And that ministry not only feeds and fills uh, those who need, not only fills them physically, but it's a ministry to feed them um, uh, God's word and, and, uh, and, and reach out to them with God's love. And, and so um, if you can ever be a part of that, that sign up is an ongoing sign up sheet out, out front. You need to, to be a part of that. But if, if you can't go and be physically in that place, then please pray for that ministry because it's so, so very important uh, ministry that we have here at the church. And, and I'll leave you with this, and I'm excited to hear Kevin this morning. Um, I'll leave you with this is we're getting closer and closer to preschool open date. And, uh, and that's such an exciting time. I see these new faces that uh, Jennifer meets here uh, to give them tours of, of the, the preschool and, and new, these young families that are signing their, their children up. What an awesome opportunity to, to share the love of Christ to these young people who, it's their, for many of them, it's their first exposure to Christ and maybe could be their last. You know, just, you know, we don't know how life, but, but such a powerful way that we can impact the world for, for Christ is in our preschool. So, so pray, 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 and tell people about it. We still got a few openings, but we're getting more and more full. Uh, we're, we're, at, we're at capacity now where we can go. Uh, we, we've got enough that we can, we can run. A, we're a, a, right around 40 kids, I think, is where we're at now. And, and that's an exciting time. So I'm not going to take up Kevin's time. I just want to pray and, uh, and ask God to bless our time together. God, thank you so much. You are amazing. God, I ask you just now that you would open our hearts and our minds, that God, that you would um, use Kevin um, just as a conduit to deliver your word, that God, that you would, through him, God, just expose your word to us, God, that we'll be moved, motivated, changed, um, that God, would you just use it in our lives, Lord, that our lives would bring glory to you. God, just be with him. Give him strength. Give him clarity of mind. It's in your name we pray, and amen. Thank you, Jimothy, his biblical name. Did you notice that when Jim was talking about America, and he said, we have a, a great country, and he said, but we do have a few issues. And he looked right over at me and Mac. <laughs> and I, I leaned over, I said, Mac, he's looking at us. And Mac said, I would too. So. Amen. <laughs> One nation under God. Psalm 33, 12 is where we're going to be. One nation under God. If you don't have your Bibles, it'll be up on the screen in just a moment. Psalm 33, 12 says this very simply. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Now, I shared this passage a few years ago on a 4th of July weekend, and I'd like to follow that message up with this one today, One Nation Under God. Now, I want to be real clear for my, my Bible friends out there who are thinking right now, don't put that verse on America. It wasn't written for America. And I want to be real clear about this. The promise, the promise in this verse is specific to the nation of Israel. God has made an eternal covenant with Israel, and he will not break it. There are, they are special people for a special purpose. As God blessed as the United States of America is, think about this for just a moment. God's grace and mercy on us has been at his pleasure and not at his obligation, like it is toward Israel. And I'll just say this real quick, and I don't care about your political leanings one way or the other, unless they're the wrong ones. But, um, but if the United States ever turns us back on Israel, we're done. You might as well take the flag down and put it in a, a, a memorial book and just look at it every once in a while and remember what it used to stand for because Israel uh, is God's chosen nation. God will always be on Israel's side and we never want to find our country, the United States of America, aligned against God's chosen nation because that will mean we are aligned against God himself. So Psalm 33, 12 is a reminder to Israel that God has their back because of his promise to them. However, Psalm 33, 12 is an example to you and I as believers that any nation on earth whose God is the Lord God Almighty can be blessed if we put God first. 
This is true for us individually, and it's true for us as a country. Now, with that understanding, I'm going to ask, if you will, if you'd like to, to read this verse with me again. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Our Christian ancestors not only knew this, they believed it. And they rescued, or they risked their life for it. And you and I sit here today, literally, because of a small group of folks that got on a boat called the Mayflower in September of 1620. Now, these people on board the Mayflower were not the first to come to America. I don't want to confuse that at all, but I want to be crystal clear, and we're going to see that it's true in just a moment, that they were the first to come to America for the sake of, for the sake of their conscience and spiritual convictions. And you may say, well, Kevin, I've heard historians in the last few years say that's not true, and I've heard scholars say that that's not true, and there's no verification of that, no proof of that anywhere, and I'm just here to tell you now, they're liars. They're absolutely lying, and they're hoping that you'll hear that and walk away and believe it. Because, you know, if you see it on on Google, it's got to be true. (laughs) If somebody on the news says it, it's got to be true. They wouldn't lie to us. I want to read you the document that these men and women on the Mayflower wrote and signed before they walked off the Mayflower onto the sand and rocks of the northeastern United States. And we'll read in a minute that these men and women were loyal to the king as they should have been, the king of England, out of respect. At this time, there was no constitution. There was no declaration of independence. They weren't even thought of. They made that trip over the Atlantic because... In their homeland, their biblical beliefs were being threatened by the government. Sound familiar? So it was out of spiritual conviction that many of these travelers left the dry ground of England for the cold waters of the North Atlantic to get here. Now we have come full circle as the church since 1620. Because those passengers on the Mayflower came here and successfully helped establish a nation, a whole nation, not just a city or a community or a village. But these 120 people helped set the course for a nation that would be established and founded on God's word. And just 400 years after they landed in America to accomplish this, 400 years in the grand scheme of things is not a long time. And just 400 years later, we find that our Christian liberties are threatened in the same way that theirs were when they left their country. But there's a big difference today. A big difference. Why is it so important that you and I as believers, and I'm speaking specifically to believers right now, why is it important that you are not apathetic, that you know why you believe what you believe, and that at the appropriate time when God leads you, You stand up for those Christian values. Why is that important? It's important because this reason. When these 120 people left their country 400 years ago, they were going to start a new belief in a new world. Today, there is no new world to sail to. God blessed America is what we have. And so far, he has blessed us. But it's up to you and I as believers, and trust me when I say this, I'm asking you to believe me. It is going to be up to you and I, believers, to stand up for the Christian faith, for God's word. To do it respectfully and rightfully, but to do it absolutely, unashamedly and boldly. Because if we don't do it, we cannot believe for a moment that unbelievers will. We cannot believe for a moment that politicians who lick their finger and stick it in the wind will stand up for what God believes, for what God has told us is true. If we don't do it, no one will. And there is no other place to sail to and start over. All the countries, all the earth is taken up. We have a privilege as American believers and a divine obligation to preserve and promote the message of Christ to our family, to our friends, to our community, to our country, and all the way 
to our world, which is one reason why Jim has brought up about the new missions ministries that we're going to be looking at over the next year and two years, because it's a part of taking what God has blessed us with in America and, and the, with the freedom to hear and receive God's word and to trust Christ as Savior. And we have that privilege and obligation to take it to our community, but also around the world. And that's why Jim and Renee and Rick, myself, Jennifer, our whole team, we do what we do each week to equip you and ourselves for that exact challenge. I want to read to you the Mayflower Compact to demonstrate their focus, their hopes, and their absolute, absolute acknowledgement of the Lord and their vision for America. And this was written 400 years ago. And then I want to share three points with you. The first two are important, but the last one is the one that really hit me. The Mayfell Hour Compact, September of 1620. In the name of God, amen. Well, we could stop right there. Is that not proof? But let's move on. We whose names are underwritten, you know, back then when you meant something and you wrote it down, you didn't just stick it anonymously in a box somewhere. You signed it because you believed it. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James by the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, and of Ireland, King Defender of the Faith, having undertaken for the glory of God an advancement. Now, this is so huge. Having taken, having taken, undertaken for the glory of God the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern part of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together in a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid and by virtue hereof do enact, constitute, and frame such and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, to which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names at Cape Cod on the 11th of November in the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland, the 18th, and Scotland, the 54th in the year of our Lord, 1620. I love the way that American historian Edward Opitz said it. And he said this a long time ago, but it's so radically true today. When you see the signs outside of the courthouse at the Supreme Court, and by the way, when you walk into those doors, behind you, up above you, are the Ten Commandments. And if I'm not mistaken, they were written by God's own hand. And so we have acknowledged God in our being and the entity of this country, but now it seems that folks are wanting to not only get away from the truth of God, but our country is moving more and more away from God himself. Edward Opitz said it like this, and he is, a, he is an American historian. He said, we are a Christian nation in the sense that our understanding of human nature and destiny, the purpose of individual life, our convictions about right and wrong, and our norms emerged out of one place, Christianity. Not out of Buddhism, Confucianism, primitive animism, or any other man-made religious practice. And it is a fact of history that our forebearers, whose religious convictions brought them to these shores, sought to create in this new world a biblically-based Christian commonwealth. A biblically-based Christian commonwealth. I want to make a huge statement, and I'm not trying to be mean with it. I'm trying to be honest because it's a true statement. If you run into folks out in the world, and I said earlier that Jim and I and Mac and Renee and, 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 and everyone here on our team and Rick, we, we want to help equip us and you. Maybe you don't know all of the facts that I'm talking about right now, but you can refer to someone. You can go home on Facebook and you can share this with someone. You can send the link in an email or a text. So the information is available. If you can't remember it, send it. It's that easy. 
But this is an important statement for us today. Those who hate Christianity in the United States are free to do so because the God they despise created the free will they abuse. Somebody asked me a great question a few Sundays ago. At the round table, we were talking about some of the issues that we're facing in the country right now and how they go directly against the Christian norms that this country was truly founded on. They go against God. And they asked me the question, what are we going to do about it? That is a great question. That is a great question. What we can do is, as believers, know why we believe what we believe. If I ask you today, as a believer, do you believe the Bible is true? You'll say yes. And if I ask you why, that's a whole other thing. Well, because I believe it. Because my parents told me so. Just because. Nobody buys just because. I don't even believe just because. The Bible calls us witnesses as believers, and as a witness, if I am a witness to a traffic accident, the law is going to come to me, and the law enforcement officer is going to say, Kevin, tell me what you saw. What did you experience? Now I'm a witness. But I can hear on the news there was a wreck. And if somebody says, was there a wreck over at Gordon Market, I can say, yeah. Were you a witness? No. Do you believe there was a wreck there? Sure. Why? I saw it. I heard it. I heard it happen. It's up to us as believers to know why we believe what we believe. And so every week at the round table and here and on Wednesday night when Jim shares and on the Sunday nights back in the fall, we start that these are times of equipping. If we are not equipped, how can we expect to go into battle? And the truth is, that's why most of us don't want to go into battle for God. We don't want to go because we feel ill-prepared. We feel like, I don't have the armor on. There's only one way to fix that, and that's to put it on. I want to talk about one nation under God, and I have three short points for you this morning. No matter what anyone says, we are one nation under God. Even atheists are one nation under God. Even if they don't believe it, they are. It's true because we are one nation under God's provision. Listen to what happened in Genesis 22. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh because it is said even to this day on that mount that Jehovah does provide. Without God's provision, we are, our wheat doesn't grow, our water doesn't flow, and our ships don't go. Can you imagine for just a moment what can happen if China decides, and by the way, their navy's bigger than ours. Their ships are not as big. They're not as powerful, but they have a million people right now in their military. We don't. Their navy is bigger than our navy. Can you imagine what would happen if they start to sail this way? And I don't know if you've noticed, but they are trying to build a base right now in Cuba. China is building a base 90 miles off our southern coast. There is no doubt that they are technologically more advanced than us. Can you imagine what would happen if China decides we will take you and own you now? What will we do without God's provision? Our military is the greatest on earth. Our military has been the David in the fights with Goliath all over the world, and we've won every single time. But without God's provision, what will we do? God provides the food we eat during COVID, we faced a lot of struggles. But can you imagine what the people faced during COVID who don't even normally have food? Remember three years ago when it was almost impossible to find a roll of toilet paper for about two months? What if that was a cup of water that couldn't be found for two months? If any generation on earth should be able at this point, in this day and time, in 2023, to understand that the unthinkable could become reality. We should be aware. 
I know, and I'm included, we all want to pretend that those three years never had existed where money disappeared and paper disappeared and, and food and all the and gas disappeared and you couldn't talk to people. People lost their jobs and their companies they had built for 50 and 60 years. But we witnessed it. Just like they witnessed it back in 1929 in October when people jumped out of windows because the stock market just imploded on itself. We are similar to that generation. We have witnessed that it's possible. We lived through it this time in COVID-19. What about COVID-20? We can't think that there won't be one. I'm not trying to scare you. COVID-20 might not happen for 50 years, but it'll come. And we have to be equipped in order to equip our children and our grandchildren. We have to say the things that need to be said today because it might be outlawed tomorrow. We are one nation under God's provision. Matthew 6, 25 through 27, Jesus said, I tell you, do not worry about your life and what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. It is not, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father, and here's the key for believers, your heavenly Father feeds them. And then I love when Jesus asked this question at the end, talking about his provision for us. He says, are you, are you not much more valuable than the birds of the air? Jesus himself, with his own mouth, with his own words, telling us how valuable we are to him. And that it's his provision that keeps us provided for. We are one nation under God's provision. We are one nation under God's protection. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 says this, But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Psalm 46.1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. I love Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes in with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. We're not only under God's provision, but we're under God's protection. I love the passage that God gave us. That says, if God be for you, who can be against you? Now, that's true for individuals, but it can be true for a country. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm going to tell you this. Publicly, over the internet, vote for the person who is closest to God's word. You're not voting for a pastor. You're not voting for a preacher, a Sunday school teacher, but vote for that person who aligns closest with God's word. And I will tell you that there are folks on both sides of the aisles in Washington, D.C., and I have sat in Congress. I have sat in those seats, in those wooden chairs, in that hall in Congress, and listened to them talk back and forth. My parents were just blessed me that way and took me there a few times. And then years ago, back in 2012, we had the privilege to take students from Anchor Church. We took 30 people all the way up to D.C. and sat in Congress. And then we prayed on Capitol Hill that God would continue to provide for us and to protect us. But that brings me to this last point. We are one nation under God's provision, and we are one nation, no matter what anyone says, under God's protection at the moment. But we are also, and this is the one that concerns me the most, we are one nation under God's patience. We are one nation under God's patience. Lamentations 2, 3 says this. We don't like to see this side of God, this, this part of God's personality, but the Bible says God loves righteousness and justice. Lamentations 2, 3 says this. In fierce anger, God has cut off all the strength of Israel. He has drawn back his right hand from before the enemy. In other words, he has stopped the enemy with his right hand. The Bible speaks of God's right hand as being strength 
And the Bible says that God had held off the enemy. It wasn't because Israel was a great military organization. It's because no matter who they were, God's right hand defeated the enemy. And God says here in Lamentations, I've removed my hands. When you look at what our country has done around the world for good and righteousness, it's amazing. And yet when you look on our homeland and what at least half of our country has decided is okay and normal, whether God likes it or not, we have to be concerned as a country about God's patience with our nation. Our enemies can and will defeat us without God's protection and without God's patience. If God allowed him, think about this for just a moment. I told you before, and I started this message with the fact, the truth, that Israel is God's chosen nation of people. The Hebrews are a special people with a special purpose. And I just read you in Lamentations where God removed. He removed his protection and he removed his patience from his own chosen nation. If God allowed his chosen people to suffer and be taken into captivity to prove to them their need for his patience and protection, there's nothing in the world stopping him from removing his hand of protection from the United States. Our country has no divine covenant with the Lord. We only have his patience. We are one nation under God's provision, under his protection, and under his patience. Here's the one thing I want us to remember as we close today. You don't have to believe America is one nation under God. That's not what's most important. I've gotten to the whole message to get to this one thing at the end. I'm going to ask the band if they'll go ahead and come up. What's most important is that your sins are under the blood of Christ. I absolutely love this country. I love this nation. It is an idea. In all of human history since the beginning of time, since Genesis 1, the idea of a free country where the people decide their own freedom, it has never been accomplished and survived. Rome gave it a shot. Other countries have tried it and gone back to a monarchy, but we, in this country, we have decided we will vote for who we will put into office and they will make the laws that tell us what we can't do. But as much as I love this country and appreciate all the men and women who have absolutely given every drop of blood they had and died for it, so we would have the freedom to come into this beautiful climate-controlled facility in this country, none of it matters. You can be as free as you want for 100 years in America, but if your sins are not under the blood of Christ, it will have all been for nothing. You being saved is what matters most. We are one nation under God. Are you one person whose sins are under the blood of Christ? I don't know the answer to that, but you know it. Would you accept Christ today? Folks listening, would you accept Christ right now? I'm not going to give you a prayer to pray. I'm just going to say this. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If your desire is as a sinner is to be saved, the Bible says if you call on Jesus, he has promised to save you. Call on him in your way to the Lord today, recognizing who you are and who he is. And he has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. No matter what happens to a country, he tells us as believers, we will be with him in all of eternity. Whatever decision you have to make today, maybe you'd like to accept Christ, maybe you would like to become a member of Anchor Church, whatever that decision is, I'll be up front as the band sings and plays.